Uh, we are now going to move on to item 7.1. Uh, Academy for College Excellence, Lighting the Fire for Learning and Achieving Success. Uh, <laughs> Vice Chancellor Linda Michalowski will introduce, oh, and Vice Chancellor Russell. Vice Chancellor Russell will start. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of continuing on with the theme of celebration and uh, also the theme from yesterday of student success. Um, we wanted to bring to you a great example from the state of a program that focuses on student success and has um, some great track records um, and also a lot of impetus to move forward. Um, in recent discussions, you had asked for more information about some of these programs, and I'm hoping that this will be the first of many that we can highlight uh, over the coming years. Uh, about successful programs that are going on in the state of California. Um, so I am going to uh, uh, turn it over to Vice Chancellor Michalowski to introduce our guest. Uh, Diego Navarro is the uh, founder and the director of the Academy for College Excellence. Some of you may have originally heard of this program. It was originally called the Digital Bridge Academy at Cabrillo College. Um, I first met Diego when we served together on a, uh, an ad hoc group that the Carnegie Foundation for Teaching and Learning put together to look at ways to do um, uh, professional development among community college staff and faculty to improve our work with uh, underprepared students. And, um, and I had already heard of Digital Bridge Academy, but I didn't really grasp what it was, how it worked, how significant it was until I had the opportunity to hear Diego present um, later. Um, Diego uh, himself uh, grew up in Pomona, California, uh, went to Pasadena City College, and, um, and then he went to work for the American Friends Service Committee and um, eventually uh, got uh, his undergraduate degree in information systems from Antioch University and um, ultimately got his master's degree uh, from the Harvard University Graduate School of Business. He then went to work in the high-tech um, field. Um, he led a couple of startup companies. And this, um, I think this experience, being in an innovative industry, uh, led to his approach to looking at the very real problems that he saw um, as he grew up in his community and wanting to um, find solutions. And so the program he's going to tell you about didn't just happen by accident. Diego uh, did very careful research and, um, and, uh, and has tested his program every step of the way so that there's significant evidence that it has a major impact on very high-risk students and um, it has recently uh, received uh, significant funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to be replicated at other community colleges in California and for him to also take it out of California for the first time. So um, with that, I'm going to let Diego tell you about the Academy for College Excellence. Thank you, Linda. Um, Pastor Smith, I think when he talked about how his goal was to help young people find their light and leave their mark in society, I think that's kind of a good summary of what we're trying to do in the Academy for College Excellence. And I may call it the Digital Bridge Academy or DBA at times because the name changed about a month and a half ago, so you may hear me say that, so I'm sorry if that happens. But thank you very much for this opportunity to be here and to present to, to this group. Um, of governors of our community college system. You have a very important job. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is, um, and let me go back to that slide, um, achieving success in basic skills education. And for some reason, the presentation is not This up. isn't on this up is not here. On. I don't on. know what the deal is. So that has to be turned on, I think. <laughs> and then we'll. Okay, let uh, somebody who's more technologically skilled than I please step <laughs> forward. I'm yeah. afraid I, I may well mess and, it and up. And I shouldn't touch it either. <laughs> um, Here's one of our new employees. We'll <laughs> uh, allow him to show his skills. I would have never found this. But. These, this equipment has its own mind. They turn off whenever they want to. Um, so why don't I just continue, because I was going to spend a little few minutes on this first slide. Um, with an introduction. So, you know, why are students at developmental levels? 
I think that's an important question that we should be looking at. You know, why are these students at developmental level? Um, and, and there's many reasons for this, and I'm going to need a light. Um, it's too dark for me to, it's a little too dark. <laughs> if I had a flash, something that would be helpful. Can we have something in between? Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works. That's, that's, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so one thing I would, I'm going to do is just give you a very brief um, example of a developmental student so you can just get a sense of them. And, and that person is myself. Um, I came out of a place called Pomona. Uh, many of you may have heard of Pomona, but most people think of Pomona College. Actually, actually, the Claremont College is in Claremont. I lived on the other side of the tracks in Pomona and went to Pomona High School, which is a very rough and tumble place. It still is today, for those of you that know LA. And um, my mother died when I was in ninth grade. So before I went to Pomona High School, she died of bone cancer in the early 70s, which mean that there wasn't pain control. And so waking up in the middle of the night with my mother screaming kind of left me raw when I went to school. And school became irrelevant to me. And it might have been for you, too, if you were in that situation as well. And I think a lot of our students that are developmental, some event happened in their life that made school irrelevant for them. And it could have been being in class and not feeling like they got it, or whatever the issue happened to be. Maybe their brother or sister was shot on the street, because a lot of our students come from very violent neighborhoods. Um, we have to face that. So I graduated from Pomona High School without being able to read and write at college level, just like many of the students that I work with. And luckily, there was Pasadena City College. And I went to Pasadena City College. I tutored in the math lab. And I worked 32 hours a week at Bank America Card Center doing 10 key operator. I had grown up in high school being a busboy and a dishwasher. And I come from a family that doesn't have a lot of money and I had to work. Um, but I like doing 10 key operator because I didn't have to wash my hands after working um, at the end of the day. Um, but I finally graduated my BA when I was 28 years old. So that kind of trajectory is similar to a lot of the students that, that I'm working with. So one thing that we have to realize is that many of these developmental students are very smart. They're very smart. And life circumstances or choices they made or the luck they had helped them end up where they're at. It's not because they're not smart. So if you're dealing with smart students that could possibly be graduate students at Harvard or Stanford but they're not reading at college level or writing or doing math at that level, how would you treat them? What kind of program would you put in place for them? Would you give them a remedial education class? I'm not sure if that's the best way to go. So what we've done is we've created a program that kind of takes a different spin on the developmental level. And I'm going to go into that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about policy, because I think we have a policy at the state level that I think is reinforcing the problem we have of trying to fix this issue. And so I'll go into that in a moment. So um, what I'm going to cover today is how effective is our program, the ACE program? What's the model, so you understand it a little bit more? Um, how, how does it work? And I'm going to have a few students give testimonials, but it'll be through video. Um, and then I'll talk about professional development, because we do a lot of work with faculty, and, and we think that's really critical for bringing this type of program to community college system, is that the faculty need to change. Not only that, our staff and our administrators. We train faculty, staff, and administrators. We've had. Um, over 1,300 students go through the program, over 50 cohorts. And next year at Cabrillo College, we will have 580 students. Um, our, we're projected to have 580 students next year at Cabrillo College. So we're going beyond boutique program because this program is low cost and it scales. It's been designed that way. And the reason why we have such success at Cabrillo College in terms of growing the program is because of the leadership and the support of Brian King and Renee Kilmer. I'd like us to give them a hand for all the support mm -hmm. that they've given us. I appreciate them coming up here with me. Um, without their leadership, our program wouldn't be where it is today. So how does our curriculum benefit students? Our curriculum benefits students because um, we develop persistence in our students. We help them persist. And I'll go into that a little bit later. We also accelerate them to transfer level curriculum fast. See, one thing I'm really tied to and, or understand is Einstein's definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if we develop developmental education programs that are like high school programs or junior high school programs where our students checked out, what are we doing? Okay, so we have to think about things a little bit differently. 
And also, we want students to accumulate transfer level credits. The, the level of credits they have, their gateways, that if they hit those gateways, they actually will, ex will complete or have a higher probability of completing. So let me tell you a little bit about some studies that were done. One was done by Columbia University. It was a longitudinal study comparing our cohorts with 11,500 students at Cabrillo. It was a multivariate analysis. And um, a couple other studies from the National Science Foundation. We've been funded by the National Science Foundation since 1983, um, doing different types of experiments in mathematics and science acceleration as well. And that's what we're currently doing right now. Um, so I'm going to point, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, Columbia study. One thing before I go into these numbers here, um, and I'll explain them in a moment, is that the ACE cohorts have a high risk factor in comparison to the 11,500 students that they're comparing our students to. That our low income zip code is double, or actually it was I think triple, the number that was in this co comparison group. We have more first and family um, students at, to attend college, 65% um, ESL student, Latinos and other minorities at higher risk factor. And despite the higher risk factor, their performance was significantly better than the student that were they were compared to. In fact, what Columbia said at the end of the study was that they felt that these estimates under or these numbers underestimated the effect of the program because of the high risk nature of our students. So if we look at college credits earned, you'll see it's a little difference, 28 percent versus 49, or 28 units versus 49. If you look at Enrolling full-time, 33% versus 65%. But look at these gateway courses. One is chance of passing one level below transfer English and passing transfer level English. You have 29% versus 71%, 37% versus 68%. Those numbers are a little bit, those numbers are important. I was told that in the study, an 8% difference meant that it was significant. So if you had an 8% difference, you wanted to actually look at this program. Well, these numbers are a little bit higher than 8%. So for, for more information, you can go to our website at um, my-ace.org, and the full study is on there as well as the NSF studies if you'd like to, some more data to understand what our program does or the effect of our program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the ACE program. And before I started my talk, one person had asked me to give a little bit about my background because they came up to me and they said, I heard that you've been a community college student uh, faculty for many years, you know, for a couple decades. And I said, no, that's actually not the case. Um, I, I did graduate research in, in, um, in innovative organization design. There's a woman named Rosabeth Moss Canner that I did my graduate research with and a man named J. Richard Hackman. And I looked at self-managing teams and how do you do innovative organizations? How do you design them? And I went to work for HP, Hewlett Packard, for eight years after graduate school. And I was doing social science research in HP labs where we're taking hierarchical management, moving it to self-management throughout the company. So I'd had a researcher's perspective. You go into an environment, you look at how it, things are going, and you figure out how to make it better by instrumenting it, by getting the best theories in place by getting the best minds to work with you on them. And the best people to work on developmental education are the faculty and the community college. They know a lot about it. And so we worked together over a number of years to put this together. And so my background's a little bit different, but we were able to harness the understanding that our faculty have. So what is the ACE program? It's academic competencies. We focus on academic competencies. We, we help the students become experts in the classroom. This is interesting. This is always fun when your presentation doesn't exactly work the way you would hope it would. Hmm. So academic competencies, yeah, sorry, I think that'll, no, they don't work. So I'll tell you what they are. So experts, we help them become experts in knowledge creation. And we do it through primary research. They learn team skills because they work together in teams a lot. And they focus on presenting, writing, and math and not necessarily in that order. Okay, the second thing, oh, here it is, analyzing information. Wow, computers have their own mind. So we also focus on professional competencies. We help them learn how to manage action. What we find in industry is that you want people that know how to make action happen. So we teach them project management. We teach them, teach them team self-management. We also help them learn the skills they need to be effective um, as knowledge workers. Because if they're going to be a, a professor at some point, or if they're going to be in the medical profession, they're going to be in knowledge industries. And we help them learn computer technologies. Wow, I'm sorry about this. Computer skills, um, because most careers that have a future, you need to know digital technologies. And we teach in Microsoft Office. And also the culture of knowledge. In addition, we focus on personal competencies, too. 
Teamwork and self-discipline is extremely important. The habits that students have that aren't successful in school, those habits help them not be successful. So if you don't focus on habits and behaviors in your educational model, then you're missing one of the biggest components that you need to work with to help these students become successful. Um, in addition, we help them see styles of other and compassion. We find that compassion is a very important aspect of persistence. And you can look at the work of um, um, Albert Bandura at Stanford. He's doing a lot of work in this area right now. It's very interesting. And then nonviolent communication, because our students come from backgrounds that are not necessarily um, a, a white collar knowledge work environment. Um, a lot of their neighborhoods are just a little bit different than that. So we have to help them understand um, ways of being. So what we focus on and what we do is we help our students take their ability to survive and persist and translate it to an academic environment. Because our students know, to, know how to survive and persist, it's just that they melt in an academic environment. So, what do you, so you need to focus on helping them take that skill and strength they have, apply it to academics, become more effective citizens and contributing members to our society. Now, how we do that is that we focus on, we, we recognize that our students have negative experience of education usually. Because they're developmental, they probably didn't do well in school beforehand, and so you have to deal with that up front. We also focus on their behaviors, as I mentioned before, and on the affective domain, as well as academics. Our model takes students that are underprepared and underserved, college-ready students, and students with multiple risk factors. We have a program. Our program is a front end, our foundation course is a front end to a nursing program at Hartnell College because they had a, a high attrition rate and they wanted to turn that around. So now the Board of Behavioral Sciences has made our foundation course a nursing course. So it's now approved for statewide use. Um, so that's why it says college ready, but that's only a, a minor part of our program. But they come into the Academy for College Excellence the whole time they're at community college. Um, and I'm sorry about this. And from there, we prepare them for knowledge-based careers, um, the careers that apply to many industries and careers that have a future. Our model is, has four key requirements, full-time attendance, and a lot of people have questions about full-time attendance, um, cohort community, high expectations, and college-level courses. Our program takes students at first semester, they go full-time, 16 and a half units. There's a number of types of themes that we do. The second <laughs> semester, there's an optional 1.5 unit course, but primarily, they take other courses towards their major starting in the second semester. This is an independence model, um, which develops agency within the student and liberates them to be effective college students after one semester intensive. <laughs> um, our program has three components. And many good programs in the country have these three components. We just do it differently. Okay, the first component is you light the fire in the student, you get them to believe what, that they can be successful students. The second is on a regular basis, you monitor their progress and you motivate the students to help them become and maintain their performance and learning what they need to do. Um, and finally, you help them with an integrated, contextualized, accelerated program to get to college level performance in one semester. Now, the difference between the way that we do it and other programs is that our first, the first part, lighting the fire, we do it in a course, a three credit course that lasts 58 hours. It happens in two weeks, right up front. It's a very intensive immersion program. We do it through curriculum. And that's what, what's different about our program. Everything that we do is done in the classroom by faculty, being paid for by FTES, and they use the external support services that any other student would use in the college. So there's no add-on costs regarding external support services. We do have faculty meet on a weekly basis. Some colleges pay for that through flex credit, saying that's a professional development obligation, or they do it saying that um, this is your obligation for committee work. And some colleges will pay um, some fee for that. But there are different ways that they handle it. Um, we do the motivating the students and helping them deal with life problems in a class. It's called Team Self-Management Course. It's two credits. It goes on the rest of the semester. It has a behavior management system tied to it that the faculty use in their weekly meetings. And then the integrated academic program we do through a project-based primary research course focused on social justice. So primary research meaning they develop research questions, they develop surveys and survey questions, they take those surveys and interview 150 people, then they put that into a database primarily an Excel database. They do f statistical analysis on it, do the findings, 
and then come up with the needs and then the solutions, a community-based action plan to deal with the solutions. And the students come up with the social justice issues that they're interested in because they know a lot about social injustice from their backgrounds. We take that course and we use that to drive over 13 weeks this primary research project where they give a final presentation to the public. 130 people will show up, the president of our college, the vice president, the mayor of our town, the city council members will come to it because they're talking about significant issues that our community faces. And they're doing research that UC Santa Cruz cannot do because their researchers can't get into the gatherings where they're going to gather the data. And you'll learn a little bit more about that. So what we do is we have them do primary research on a topic they understand, and then we feed English and math and career planning and computer skills just in time as they need it to complete that project where they go through a rites of passage at the end as an expert presenting to the public. Now, this is where I wanted to mention the issue about policies, especially our state policy. I think there's one that we should be looking at. You know, different types of basic skill models, you know, are, require different types of um, approaches, um, especially if you want to make them scalable and you want to make them sustainable and have outcomes. And so the point that I want to raise is that I think our California basic skills policy is confused. And I want to try to bring clarity what that confusion might be. We've mixed up the solution and the problem. Let me say that again. We've mixed up the solution and the problem. What we've done is we've defined and measured basic skills by level of classes. So when we look at basic skills, we say if it's a 200 level class or two levels below, it's a basic skills class. Well, I think what we need to do is we have to look at the student and say, we have a student that's basic skills, but let's try different ways of meeting the need of that student. So if you try an accelerated approach that isn't considered basic skills, then you're not in a 200 level class. I think we, what we need to look at is not to limit innovation by narrowing our approach to a definition of the solution, but by defining it as the problem, which is the level that the student's at, and then allow us to do different innovative approaches to try to meet that change. And I think if we could turn that around, that would be a very helpful thing for many faculty that are trying different solutions and trying to address the problems in new and different ways. And I think it's important for us to measure outcomes and compare the different innovative approaches that we're trying. So focus on the level of the student. Let the innovators innovate. Don't say that you have to do it this way by these different levels. Just allow people to innovate, but give them a certain time frame and make sure they're measuring well so that you can look at the outcomes. So um, what I'd like to go on to is how does ACE work? ACE works because um, we repair the damage done by past educational experience, and we also focus on an inside-out transforma inside transformational model. We also help students believe that they can do it. And we focus on the strengths of our students. Many of our students have PhDs. And I think people get confused by this. These students have PhDs in social injustice. They really understand social injustice in a way that many of us don't. So if you want to create a strengths-based program, you focus on social justice because you continue a, fi a fire inside of them. And if you structure it, it'll drive their knowledge acquisition where they'll put a lot of time into learning because they're trying to study a phenomena that's affected their life, their family, and their community. Just have to figure out how to do that in a way that gets them prepared for college level performance. We also create a virtual dormitory environment and we accelerate our students. So let me have a few students. I have about four students that will give a, a 30 second talk. But this is a student. Her name is Celia. She's in medical assisting program now. Or she was, this, she was in our program about five years ago. She's graduated from that program. She comes from an abuse background. And um, she felt she could be more, but she wasn't sure how. And let her tell you a little bit about her story. When the first two weeks were done, I had no doubt that I could accomplish my goals of becoming a nurse. I wanted to first start as a medical assistant, and then I wanted to become a nurse. And um, I can't even, I can't even express to you guys like, just the desire that he had lit in me, just to want to learn, to want to continue. Like, wow, I can do this. You know, the grass is starting to look greener for me every time. Like the grass would look greener on the other side. You know that saying. Well, that's how I've always felt. You know, especially from my background of what I had seen. You know. Um, I would be envious about other people, you know, like, oh, I want to be like them, I want to be like them. Well, now I'm, like, so excited to be me, you know. It's like, oh, 
you know, here I am young, I'm still young, I'm trying to do this goal, I'm trying to accomplish, me, accomplish it, and I feel like I... That I can, was her last words. Mm -hmm. Celia, she changed the view of herself going through our semester. And um, she mentioned that he lit a fire in me. What it was was a class. I, we, we have now six cohorts at Cabrillo College. We have seven, six cohorts at Hartnell College. We have cohorts at Berkeley City College and Las Positas College. And I'm not teaching those courses. Other faculty are teaching them through the curriculum that we've developed. Um, so she has felt a, a different experience in her life. Um, this is another student, Felicitas. I met her when she was 26 years old. She was burnout. She had two jobs she'd been working since she was about 16 years old. Um, and she never went to high school. She had to leave school because she got pregnant when she was 15, never went to high school. She's now um, in our wait line for the nursing program. She's done all her prereqs. But when she came to our college, she hadn't gone to high school at all. I learned about myself. I learned what to expect from me. What else could I do to get my kids out from the hole I was? And I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this. I can make it. I know I can. And I think she ends it with, and I know I can. And she has four children. And when she started our program, her older son would help her with her math. But now she helps all of her kids with all of their homework because she knows how to do it. And she's become a really powerful role model in her family. And this woman, when she was 12 years old, came over the border with her mother and her sister, went through Arizona, ended up in LA, and then moved to Watsonville when she was 13 years old. Was the only person in her family that graduated from eighth grade ever. Then she got pregnant and had four children. And that took her in a different direction. This student is named Sergio, and he's, he's in his mid-40s. And he had an alcohol abuse background. And um, he woke up one point when his favorite sister died. She was a doctor, and she died of cancer. And he woke up and said, I need to change my life. And this, he talks about where Cabrillo College, um, our program started in Watsonville. We had a brand new site built there, a new campus. And before that building was put there, it was a bank. And he talks about that in this video. My life was in such a bad situation that I didn't care for, for nothing. So before Cabrillo, before this place was built, there was a small building here, a bank at one point, and then the bank closed and, and it became empty, the building. And at night, I used to come to, 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 to hide in, in that building to drink. And when the building got torn, I felt like something was taken out of my heart. Where was I going to go to hide, drink at night? I started seeing this whole new building going up. And I would always pass by and I would look. You know, who would say that one point in my life, I was going to be here in the same place where at one point I was drinking and, and getting wasted, now I'm getting educated. So this place, to me, has a lot of, a lot of good things. I love it, too. Now I'm drinking. And I can't paraphrase what he said at the end, but Sergio is a really great writer. He's a really good writer. And finally, this is a student from Merritt College in inner city Oakland. Um, her name is Angela, and she was lost and didn't know her potential. I can see myself being a lot more disciplined. They gave me a, they gave me a floor plan, basically. If I follow these blueprints, I couldn't see myself being anything but successful. So one thing that we do and why we're different is we create a virtual dormitory. When I went to Pasadena City College at the end of the semester, I knew no one that I went to school with. And to this day, I know no one that went to Pasadena City College with me in my classes. We call it community college, but we really don't have community in the community college. And that's unfortunate because it's an untapped resource are the students pulling themselves through if you create community with them in an intense environment where they're all going in the same direction. And so we create what we call a virtual dormitory through our curriculum by building that model with them. So finally, I want to touch on professional development. We've trained over 250 faculty. This summer, we're going to have four trainings. We usually do one in the summer and one in the winter. And this summer, we're doing four. And um, this program um, has, uh, we have different quotes from faculty. Um, and so, for example, my retention rate was low, 60%. After using ACE in one semester, my retention rates went up to 90%. Now, one thing that we're doing is that we're, um, 
one of the things that the Gates and Hewlett funding is, is paying for in the next five years is a longitudinal study of our faculty training. Because we've been hearing anecdotal evidence that faculty retention rates are going up in their non-ACE classes, in their regular classes, but now we're going to study it. We're going to actually have evaluators look at before and after student retention in their classes before and after they went through our training. Um, another one is this went from good to great. Um, when I went through the training, I came out with a different perspective on myself. Now that I'm using it in the classroom, I have a different perspective on my students. So not only is our curriculum transformational for students, it's transformational for faculty. And we find that that's a really important piece. And um, many, many faculty at our college now have taken it, as well as we have a staff professional development program. We find that financial aid staff people and a and staff people um, all have a connection with the students and our program helps them even develop that more effectively. And administrators go through our program too. And, and without Renee and Brian's support, we wouldn't have trained as many people at our college. Um, what I'd like to close by saying is that, um, you know, we didn't create the problem of underprepared students. You know, community colleges didn't create that problem. But we have a responsibility to address it. And we need to figure out how can we do it with programs that are scalable, sustainable, and that don't cost a lot more than the regular way of meeting the needs of these students. So that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Diego, for your presentation. Uh, I uh, first heard you uh, when I was at a class initiative down in San Diego, and uh, I recall being so inspired uh, by what you're doing. Uh, I think all of us in the community college uh, recognize that one of our uh, greatest challenges is to uh, uh, meet the needs of these basic skills students. Uh, and we have 70% uh, of the students who come to our colleges uh, are not prepared for freshman English or freshman math or both. And uh, as uh, Diego said so eloquently, we didn't create the problem, but we're supposed to be a solution to the problem. And uh, I know that some of the things we're doing just aren't working. Sometimes we put people, for instance, two levels down in basic skills, and we expect to drill them and get them to come on up to the, to the level. And some of them do, but the attrition rate is, uh, frankly, very high. Many of them just don't make it. And this kind of approach seems to me uh, to be one of the ways that, that uh, is successful. Uh, and I think basic skills is one of our top priorities. Uh, uh, my wife, uh, Lacrita, was an English teacher for 20 years at Cerritos College, and she always taught at least one class of developmental English because she loved to work with students who had the problems, but she went through the Puente program and that helped change her methodology in teaching. That it was, uh, and, and uh, she did, she was fortunate, she had a good success rate with students and she said just what Diego said, you know, the, the, the uh, stories are, are so heartwarming and touching because these people come and they want to be helped and, and, and most of our teachers want to help them but a lot of times we don't know how to do it, and I think this is a model that excites me a lot, and I knew that the Board of Trustees would love to hear this because you're here, we're involved in setting policy, and this is a, an exemplary program uh, that I hope we can duplicate throughout the state, and so thank you for taking your time to come, and it's great. I know both uh, Brian and Renee and the kind of leadership they exercise at Cabrillo College, and I compliment them as well, but thank you. Uh, Diego, you've uh, shown us something here that I think uh, inspires us all and, and we can begin to replicate this uh, in ways that will make basic <coughs> skills even more successful in the state of California. So I just wanted to thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your presentation, um, Member McDougall and Member Ramos. <laughs> yes, i just like to thank you very much. I think your presentation was inspiring and I think it's exactly what all of us support in terms of approaching a problem from a theoretical perspective, having a research base, constantly looking at it, evaluating, and coming out with the best practices, and then yielding a product that is duplicative so that it can be applied in other settings. So I really applaud 
uh, your commitment uh, to the students who are coming into the community college with this inability to succeed and how critical it is to find new methods of reaching them, touching them emotionally so that they can attach themselves to, to the process. And I think that's very, very difficult to do and, and I applaud you for doing it. The one uh, request I would have as a board member, I, I, I would find it very helpful to receive some additional information on this program. We have the description in our board book but that's it. And frankly, it leaves you wanting. Right. So uh, I would appreciate more, but I thank you very much for your work and wish you continued success, and particularly in exposing it uh, to your colleagues throughout the system. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's a very good suggestion. I'll, I'll leave it up to the Vice Chancellors and then Jerry to maybe send something out to all of us. Thank you. And I, I want to take responsibility for it not going out is that this file turns into 11 and a half megabyte file <laughs> when you make a PDF. Just a little, it. just a summary. Executive yeah, summary would be really, fine. <laughs> it gets really big and so I was unable to email it before coming up so I'm sorry about that. Okay, we'll take it <laughs> after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Member Ramos. Thank you. Um, Diego, thank you uh, for the inspiration. I, I share the views that have been uh, expressed already in terms of uh, you know, how, how um, quality driven this work is and, and how imperative it is that we, we really take it to scale. So my question is, what would it take in your judgment, uh, the judgment of you and your colleagues who are doing this work to, to scale this program up to the point where, as Chancellor Scott suggests, it could be a system-wide intervention that would really have uh, optimal maximum impact uh, over time? What are we talking about in terms of the financial realities of that, what the logistical realities of that? What would you need to make that happen? And how can we help to possibly support that? That's a good question. Um, right now, next week, um, actually this week, we're starting the strategic planning process um, with the funding that we've received. We've hired FSG Impact, which is the um, stri strategic planning firm that um, Michael Porter from Harvard Business School started out of their San Francisco office, we're working with their people there. And those are some of the questions that we're answering. And we've been looking at this for a number of years. I've worked with a lot of different people. And we don't have the exact number, but if you go to our website and you look at, there's a section that's on bringing ACE to your college. We, ha we start to list <coughs> out, we have different virtual webinars that people can go to about our program and we do them on a monthly basis. And it's gonna get to the point where it's gonna start to lay out how much it costs to bring it in, how to replicate it, um, all those different pieces. And so we're building all that capacity right now. I just don't have the answer. Um, by August, we, we, should have it, our, we should have that answer pretty well laid out. We have a very clear way of how to make this spread. And the way to do it is through faculty. And faculty are the key. Of course, faculty are really dedicated. You know, I, my daughter, my son will go to community college. My daughter has. She graduated last year. Because community colleges have great teachers, great teachers that are dedicated. And so without harnessing faculty, you can't have anything spread. And that's why professional development is so important for our program. And it's word of mouth that gets out. I mean, we started out with, I think, seven, no, four, two faculty from Cabrillo and now we have over 25 that come to our trainings each time. Wow. And so the word gets out, if it's a significant for them, they will bring other people to it. And we have a web, on our website a video of faculty that talk about their experience going through the faculty training. One of them from, San Francisco, from City College of San Francisco, she'd been in the great teacher's experience, she's been in the program that's in Appalachia, um, the Developmental Ed Institute, Kellogg Institute. Uh -huh. And she said in that video, you'll hear her speak, she says, I've never experienced anything like this before. And um, it's the same curriculum we use for the students. Because if you're using, if you're doing transformational education with students and you're using a curriculum to do it, well, faculty can't teach that because they can't go to the university and study transformational education. Mm -hmm. And there's a journal put out by Columbia that's on that, but it's a new <coughs> thing. And so what we've done is we create a curriculum and in order for faculty to teach it, they have to experience it first. Because you've got to build that internal barometer to understand what that's about <coughs> and then you utilize that in the classroom. And I think that's the shift that we're making is we're moving to the affective domain, which is absolutely critical. And then it has the effect of changing the way faculty work with students in their regular classes. Right. So it then changes their ability to have retention rates that are different. And so um, 
we're, we'll get to the point where we'll know exactly what it'll take. Um, but our website starts to lay that out. Great. When, when you guys have more data and evidence, uh, I, I think it would be interesting to all of us as members of the board to, to hear back from you. Great. We're, if that's we're, possible, we'd, we'd want to follow up on that. What, what we're doing right now is we have a five-year longitudinal study that's starting. Um, and it's being put on NPR Associates in Berkeley. It came highly regarded from Columbia as a group for us to work with. We interviewed a number of firms, of course. Um, but the key thing that we're doing is we're bringing in an academic researcher um, in self-efficacy and leadership. His name is Martin Chemers, very well known throughout the United States. What we're doing is developing the academic and theoretical model of why the students are persisting and changing. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at self-identity, self-efficacy, and we're actually instrumenting it so that we're going to figure out why this type of approach works. And why that's important is that if we can understand how it ties to theory, it can change theory, but also it'll help the theorists understand how it affects community college students because they tend to do their studies with university students. That's where they get their subjects. And so we don't have a very good basis of understanding our students. Those of us that went through this type of program, not this program, but this type of institution and where we come from our neighborhoods. And so what we're doing is we're bringing in the academic and theoretical research infrastructure to try to understand that so that we have a basis in which to say why this works. And then you can apply that to practice. When you apply it to practice, then you can really leverage it. And when I say pro apply it to practice, it's going beyond best practices and because there's, there's different ways of applying to practice. So that's what we're working on next. So we will have results. We'll be doing a yearly um, download of all the transcripted data and we'll be Thank you so out. much. Great. You're welcome. Um, Member Baca and Member Azumi. Diego, thank you for your work. You know, I, I, I'm always reminded about um, the various programs that we've had over the years, the OPS, the Summer Bridge, Upward Bound, and uh, Puente, and other uh, programs which have uh, been very effective at reaching out to students and getting them to a, to a different level. But what I was struck most in, in your presentation here is is the, the focus on the individual and what inspires that person because too often we tend to look at, um, at uh, basic skills in a, in a, in a, in a uh, most procedural way when uh, it really, to get a student successful, means reaching in and finding out what it is that, uh, that's, uh, that's not there or the things that are preventing that student from moving on. And whatever we do, and it has to be with the, with the faculty across the campus that, um, you know, finds out a little bit about what that student uh, may need, motivates them, and uh, working together to get them to a different level. Because we can provide the basic skills tools, uh, but if they aren't inspired, uh, th they don't know its use, then uh, it, it may, be, may fall in deaf ears. So thank you. Good work. And, and capacity inside the student is the critical thing you have to do first is help build that in them. You know, what we're finding is faculty love talking about their students together. There's not enough collaboration. Mm -hmm. You'll have department meetings, but those aren't usually that level of discussion. So our faculty meet every week, and they talk about the same students because they know those students. And they talk about their curriculum, how it affects those students. And so what they're finding is that they're getting a lot of joy and pleasure out of having the type of collegial dialogue that they want focused on something they can all touch and feel and measure, which are these same students. And so I think that model is really a beautiful way to have faculty feel um, joy from their work. And Puente and EOPS, I mean, it's unfortunate what's happening with the cuts and stuff with the economy and what's happening. Those are great programs that are out there that have been doing very good work for a long time. And we looked at those programs in the design of this as well. Member Izumi. I want to echo what my colleagues have said, Diego, about, uh, you know, how uh, fascinating and uh, exciting your program is. And uh, I, I especially like the fact that uh, it's uh, replicable and uh, in the, the scalable uh, aspect to it, I think is extremely important given the fact that there are various success stories that we see in, you know, areas such as basic skills, but they're not always replicable and it's very difficult to scale them up. So they end up being kind of isolated silos of success, but yeah. that's all they end up doing. It's just helping, you know, 30, 40 students, and which is great, but not enough. And so I think this this is uh, uh, holds a lot of promise. And I I want to echo what my colleague uh, uh, board member Ramos said that uh, I'd really love to see the data and evidence as it becomes available as you 
uh, follow these cohorts in your longitudinal study. I was wondering, uh, um, uh, in terms of, uh, you had t uh, touched on the, the fact that at certain po uh, points in the uh, in the students' uh, education, in, using your curriculum, they, you uh, get them familiar with technology. And so I wonder if you could expand on that. So uh, how do you use that technology at what point and uh, you know how, how how do you specifically get them familiar and proficient at using that technology so um, we primarily do it through our social justice primary research project where the students are developing research questions and they need to develop a survey and take it out to the public and interview 150 people so your survey has to be on paper so they have to use word to go and create it. So they learn Word because they need to have that done, plus their papers they need to do for class. So that's the first step. The second is that they're out interviewing 150 people, and they're going to have 150 surveys with 45 questions each. If you're going to sit there and try to tabulate it, you're going to go crazy. And, that, and so what we do is we teach them Excel four weeks before they need to use it, and then they use Excel to create the database. So they learn Excel, and these students want to know the phenomena. They've come up with the questions. They want to know what the answers are, and so they want to interpret it. So they have a drive to do Excel where many of us wouldn't want to do it, but they want to know what the answers are. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to give a public presentation to 130 people, and some of them have already come to ones from previous semesters, so they know what it's like to be in this room with it, filled with people, and you're standing up there. Well, you can you know, show a piece of paper or you can do a presentation that's somewhat like this one. And so they learn PowerPoint because they know what it's going to be like to be in front of people and no one likes to give something, give a presentation and, and fall on your face. And so I find that skin in the game is absolutely critical. You have to mm -hmm. put skin in the game and if they've got to perform and you try to do this every class, mm -hmm. they will perform because they don't want to look not, not prepared for their other students, let alone the public. Mm -hmm. And so we help them learn the technology because they're interested in social justice issue that they're trying to study. And, and one thing I want to point out is that our program is designed like a graduate program. I think graduate educational models are the right models for basic skills students. Mm -hmm. Number one, you have them in a cohort. Graduate programs put students in cohorts. Number two, we focus on primary research. Students that have low ability in reading and writing, it's hard to do synthesis. Synthesis is secondary research. What do we focus on in our English class and lower divisions? Synthesis. Well, you throw them in a primary research environment, they become critical thinkers, but they're more like graduate students. And so you get the wiring going for them so they start to understand critical thinking, and it's on a topic they know a lot about. You know, they're not researchers that stand away. They're interpreting the data because they know what's going on. And I was mentioning earlier that UC doesn't get to the types of parties our students go to. Our students, for example, this semester, they studied the closing of the needle exchange program in Santa Cruz that happened. It's a program that had a bunch of things. Well, a number of these students had been using that program in the past. And what they did was they went down to the levee and they, interv they interviewed 75 people that previously used that service. You know, so the students are doing research that is really important and they're getting to the populations that you can't get to. Like our students will go into gang parties and get right. gang members to fill out surveys. Mm -hmm. You know, right. UC will not send their students <laughs> down to that environment. So, I mean, the data we're getting is really good. It's on our website. Go to the website at Cabrillo College and you'll see the past research. There's 33 studies now that have been done on many different topics uh, that are important to our community. Now, the question about scaling this program and we talk about there's two types of scale I think it's important that you understand two types of scale one is the scale that you do from a boutique program to reaching a lot of students in your college and with the support of Renee and Brian we're going to 580 students next year okay that's one type of scale the second scale is how do you get it into a number of colleges okay, our approach to the scale to a number of colleges is based on what's called a generative model okay, I'm not the only one that teach faculty. I have master mentors that now teach faculty, not just me. And our goal is, is to have master mentors on every campus teaching our faculty development, professional development training, mm -hmm. so that then they teach the workshops and the colleges become liberated because they have the people on their own staff that can train their own people. And so we, we like a liberating model for the student as well as for colleges. So they don't have to pay the cost of it. They do it through their own FTES generation, their own professional development mm -hmm. budgets. So it's a generative model. It's a totally different way of looking at this. It's harnessing the community of practice, oh. which faculty have a lot of energy. Mm. Thank and you. Great. Uh, member Davis-Lyman and then Member Baum. Thank you. 
Diego, this is, thank you for your courageous spirit uh, for demystifying this whole basic skills um, movement issue concern that uh, we have in the state of California as well as in the nation by changing the culture to a culture of hope and success and really using the strength, seeing the strengths in your students. Oftentimes I think we hear people say we've got to motivate the basic skills. Those basic skills students that you have and you're talking about uh, and they're talking to us on this um, uh, DVD are highly motivated to get to the college, to get through everything they have to do to get registered. That's a lot of motivation right there. And um, I, you know, the, the way you have taken a holistic view of the student, I think is so encouraging. That artificial, we have for so long artificially divided our students. We have instruction, we have student services. Students do not see themselves like that. They see themselves as a whole person, not divided up to head and heart. Mm -hmm. But somehow we buy into that student services instruction are very separate um, kind of entities. You've taken the strengths, strength of your students and the strength of the college, and you mentioned something that I think is so critical, is that you have to have the support from the top strong support, courageous support from the top to really let, as you said, innovators innovate. Thank you so much. Thank our leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Member Baum. First off, as one who's also connected to Pasadena City College, mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, your work and your leadership on this. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, we're, we're justifiably proud of your uh, entrepreneurial spirit and development and passion for this issue. Um, I really like the idea that you raised the concept of the virtual dormitory. I've, I've worked at two residential private universities and uh, to capture that, that invisible curriculum that's not in the classroom and be able to find a way to translate that to the, uh, the basic skills in community college students is, is, is a, a concept that's, that's great to uh, continue to pursue. So I look forward to hearing that. Also, what was it, what, I love the idea of taking the basic skills students and, and, and engaging them in research so that they can, uh, they can have that firsthand knowledge. Uh, you found with them that the social justice was an angle that got them passionate and turned that light on them. Are there other uh, aspects of the program that might be uh, studied across uh, the system so that, because there's a lot of persistence programs at colleges and universities, uh, colleges across, we honor them quite a bit here in, in, uh, at the Board of Governors, that they could take elements of your, uh, of the programs that you're developing and say, these are like four factors that if you're gonna try on your campus uh, or try to incorporate into the, your Puente project or your Upward Bound project, or we have something uh, called Stepping Up at Pasadena City College that, uh, uh, could do that. Uh, will you be sharing that also that if, if not your particular program that there's certain aspects that should try to be uh, uh, incorporated into other similar programs? Um, yes, and, and Pasadena City College has some really good programs. Your Math Jam program and Math XL and spent a lot of time with Brock and oh, yeah, Linda sure. so I, I know them pretty well. Um, yeah, there, there are certain, there's, there's three basic components to our program. Okay. And um, this slide kind of helps with it. Um, the first is getting the fire lit inside of the students. And so we provide this course curriculum, foundation course, and the professional development for faculty to experience it and learn to teach it. That's the first thing that's exportable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long to learn how to do it. And then long, I mean, in weeks. You know, it takes a couple weeks. Um, then this class here is a class on team self-management. And it helps create that cohort that shares with each other and that pulls each other through. I mean, I find that I've never given a student my cell phone number, but the students give each other their cell phone numbers and they call each other at four o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the morning and I'm really glad they do that. And um, they pull each other through. And We have to learn to get the teacher out of the center of the classroom and have the student in the center of the classroom and the community. And the only way you can do that is through curriculum together because one-on-one -on -one coaching doesn't do that. Because you keep reinforcing that bonding external to the program, you need to build the the energy in the program mm -hmm. around the students. And so those two things we export. 
with the training that helps you with it and the curriculum. The last part is the, this integrated academic program, but we have different themes. Social justice is for one segment of students. We have students that come in knowing what CTE program they want to be in, but we have CTE-oriented themes. Okay. Okay, we have a theme, nursing's now doing it in terms of their, their persistence, but there's a program on green technology at Hartnell College. At Cabrillo College, we're doing math acceleration in a CTE type of environment, contextualized CTE, envir CTE environment. And there's different approaches you can take towards CTE. If you look at Las Positas, they're working with learning disabled students. And it's pretty phenomenal the uh, success they've had with those students through this program. And they were totally blown away when they did it. And UC Santa Cruz Center for Justice, Tolerance, and Community did the evaluation of that program. So, Thank so you. there's different themes but only two components, a foundation course and a team self-management course. That's what makes it able to just go around. It, this I, thing can move. I was interested, uh, how do you do the virtual, virtual, virtual dorm? Okay, so the, the first is you have them in, in immersion what? environment for two weeks. Okay. They're in class from 9 to 5.30. Okay. And in two weeks, you take them through a transformational educational model. So it's experiential based. Mm. Okay, it's experiential, it's not lecturing to them. There's one part where we do a little bit of lecture, but it's, it's, a, it's a, an exercise we call the, the industrialization of public education. Okay, and we want them to see how we industrialize public education because it affected how they did. Mm -hmm. And until they understand that the system is part of the problem of mm -hmm. their ability, the more they can start to go, oh, it's not me, and they change their self-identity, which is really critical. Mm -hmm. They build the capacity that, um, that Mr. Ramos was, was mentioning. So that capacity is important. So what you do is they go through that experience, and we do these things called concentric circles, which was developed by this one group. We, we used curriculum from all over the place. We, I looked at 36 different curriculum. I did a year and a half of research, five pilots, 40 hour a week pilots, taking nine of the curriculum and actually trying them in different sequences so we could understand what lit the fire inside of students. Mm. You can look at, how do you light a fire inside of students? Well, you come up with research questions. How long does it take? What kind of curriculum do you need? Does it need to be residential? I mean, there's a bunch of different ones, about six. We looked at that, figured out what it took to light the fire inside of students consistently with very high risk groups so you knew they didn't fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So we did that first. So you build that cohort and they care about each other now and they all know they want to be successful college students. But many of these students have behaviors that take them in that direction, mm -hmm. the direction they were walking in, <coughs> that they were running in before they came into the program. And you need to help them take implicit decisions and make them explicit. Help them move those behaviors towards their goal. Mm -hmm. And so we do strategic planning process with them that was developed by Shell Oil and a bunch of big companies, but you can apply it to individuals where you're looking at scenarios. If I do this, what's the end product gonna be? Well, what happens, a lot of these students made unconscious decisions. Oh, I wanna go party, I don't wanna miss, I wanna miss class with these various things. You have to take them through the process of making those decisions again now in this academic environment. And we do it through a class. It's not a hit or miss thing where you go out and mm -hmm. you're having a problem, you're not getting your homework done, we're gonna have you go see that person. That's a deficit model. Our model is a strength-based model. Everything's done in the classroom. I have to think about this, you have to think about it, we all have to think about it, because this is important. And then, since the students trust each other, you ask them questions every other week, like, what's keeping me from being successful? And then you have them present it to the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. And then when they present, they say, oh, I just can't get up in the morning. And you say, well, are you willing to have somebody share with you an idea? Well, this is called peer advising. Mm -hmm. Well, then they say, well, put the clock in the other side of the room, <laughs> or I'll call you the next morning. And then you say, well, who's willing to help them? And people raise their hand, will you choose someone? I'll give you extra credit if you help each other, mm -hmm. and I'm going to monitor that mm -hmm. in the future. You build the cohort to provide the support services they need. Okay. What they need is money. Okay, we've got to figure out this financial aid issue, and I think there is, um, at least from my discussions with the Gates Foundation and what's going on in Washington, that there is a movement around that, but the issue is can we come up with efficient and effective programs so that that money's gonna be used wisely? Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the big issue that we've gotta determine. So did that answer your question? Yes, that, yes, that's how we very, build persistence. very much, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much for coming and presenting your program. We look Thank forward to more information. And we will get a further summary of the program with a little bit more detail that we'll share with you and, um, and provide the web links so that anyone who's interested can go look. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.